All right. As you might recall, we're covering our series on spiritual dispensationalism. I feel like that I could change the name a little bit more. Uh, as time passes by, and as we keep going through our lessons, I feel like that uh, this should be changed more, but I don't know, we'll see as I keep teaching. But for now, we'll call it spiritual dispensationalism. Recall this, is that there is no doubt that there are verses in the Bible where we might have to do double application, okay? In other words, that, uh, you could take one verse, half of it could apply to a different person, different time period, and the second half could apply to a different person, different time period. The only way that could be possible is if it's done spiritually. That is what I strongly emphasized and argued. I convinced you with that scripturally. There are so many verses that proved it. I've proved it academically as well. Even secular scholars admit that this is a valid method. They just didn't find the right term for it. They just didn't find the right method for it, just like we Bible believers found. That's dispensationalism. But now we add a spiritual layer. The third thing is theologically. Now, I've shown you from last week, theologically, it connected every doctrine, all of our fundamental beliefs of our Christian yes. faith. It just made more sense theologically speaking. Amen. So I proved it through those three means. Now I'm going to explain to you how to do spiritual dispensationalism, how this works. Now, the reason why that is very important, so he's excited, brother. <laughs> you have to forgive him, all right? <laughs> so, how spiritual dispensationalism works, we got to first understand the danger with it. Now, I talked to some of my uh, Bible-believing friends, and one of the things that they're concerned about with this method, which I already knew, would, which would be a problem, is that if you look at a verse then you can spiritualize it however way you want, okay? So you can apply any person or any time period there. Now, I've shown you that this method is valid, and it is workable, and it is a matter-of-fact truth, okay? So there's no doubt about it, but we need to find how to do it, okay? Now, uh, credit to whom credit is due, so I did not come up with this method myself. Uh, there are Bible-believing preachers out there who laid the foundations. Amen. But what I'm doing is now I'm taking what they've laid down, I'm combining it, examining it, and making it th so thorough that it has to be true. Wow. And I've proven that through our last three teachings. But now, here's the thing that bothered me the most, and I've addressed it to one of my Bible-believing friends as well, that this method, it seems to be where... I warned you in the academic realm, there's a hermeneutical school, a biblical interpretation school that has a liberal approach, which they call uh, reception theory. In other words, reception literary theory. In other words, how does a verse mean to you? So you can interpret it however way it feels meaningful to you. We don't want to end up like that. We don't want to end up like Jehovah Witnesses who take all the verses and spiritualize everything and claim that the 144,000 uh, virgin Jews in Revelation 7 is spiritual Jews of the 144,000 Jehovah Witnesses up in heaven. Okay? Baloney, that don't make sense. Anybody can spiritualize verses then. The method, okay, and one of my brothers pointed this verse out to me, and I told him that uh, I'd give it in our later lesson, all right? And that's the problem with you Bible believers. You know too much, and then you just ruin my zeal and my fire that I'm about to show you later on, all right? But God bless you for knowing more Bible, okay? So keep up the good work, even though I frown it. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay, the key, and it's so simple. We just never thought of it before, okay? What do you do when you're doing something spiritually? This is the key. When you're doing something spiritually, how do you make this foolproof? How do you make this valid and true? 
This is foolproof, okay? This cannot be broken. It's valid, it's also very critical. So in other words, you can be skeptical, you can be critical, and build up this spiritual interpretation more. Now, I've exaggerated that spiritual dispensationalism or spiritual interpretation is as strong as, a, as the scientific method. My personal opinion, I think it's true, all right? But out to the outside world, it's exaggerated fine. But I'll show you why I think that way, okay? It is very critical and it is very valid. One is we do know academically that has to be a tool where you bridge spiritual and historical application, right? Okay, that's, a, that's undoubtedly valid in the academic realm. But now we have to make this interpretation foolproof. We have to make sure that it has no error. The simple answer, and God already gave you the answer, what to do with spiritual things when you're doing spiritual actions. Compare spiritual things with spiritual. That's, good. Amen. that's it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So notice right here that the things that God has given to us can be freely used. See that? That's why we've seen so many verses that seem to be freely used, right? As spiritual application. For example, Paul did a free quote. The Holy Spirit did a free qu quote of Romans 1.17 from Habakkuk 2. Do you remember that in our last set lesson? The just shall live by his faith. But that's referring to works out of his faith. But Paul didn't care about that. He just freely quoted off of that for faith, not works. But why can he do that? Is there validity with spiritual interpretation. Well, Paul obviously had the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and that's the advantage that you and I didn't have. However, he had the validity of other spiritual authority. The other spiritual authority were the apostles. Jesus Christ said that he would give his spirit to the apostles, that they would speak his words. See that? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But we don't have that advantage like Paul, obviously. But our advantage is already simple. We have the Word of God. Amen. The Word of God is a spiritual book. It's His spiritual Word. So all you have to do is when you look at one verse, now think about this, and you notice that's what we've done for double application. Do you recall the very first lesson, how I proved spiritual dispensationalism? I compared Scripture with Scripture. Yeah. And it proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that this method is valid. That the interpretation too is valid. So you compare scripture with scripture. So that, that's why the Jehovah Witness can't win. How do you, 144,000 Jehovah Witness, give me a verse on that. It's that simple. They can't pull up another verse on that. By the way, I don't think you'll find 144,000. Even that number in the Bible verse. I don't, I don't think you can even find a verse on 144,000, just the number itself. So when we think about this, then we realize that this is so valid, this is so critical when we compare Scripture with Scripture. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's how you're going to find it. The Bible says in verse 13, Which things also we speak, not the words with man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay. Now, um... I'm just going to throw these two in as a bonus. But this is basic within hermeneutical methods. And by the way, theologians will agree with this method of interpretation. I think even Jehovah Witnesses too, okay? 
So, or some Jehovah Witnesses. But you ever heard people when they argue scripture with scripture with you, they argue about the context? So context is important. And then when you have context, here's what makes us Bible believers compared to all the other scholars, okay? Our advantage is we believe in looking at the word exactly as it says, okay? Literal word. By the way, remember historical criticism, that academic uh, school of interpretation? They believe in looking the word exactly as it says. Remember, that's what the Antiochian church fathers, Luther, argued for objective scriptural interpretation. That's a real, valid, academic, hermeneutical tool. So we look literally at the word as it says. So when we combine scripture with scripture, with context, literal word, and if the literal word is also in context with the history, right? The historical timeline. Then you win in the interpretation. Now, this is foolproof. There's no way you can get around that. Now, I know that cults and many other people will say, well, you know, everybody argues the context, so how do you know whose context is right? Simple. Does it follow these? A lot of time they only pick one. You know what you should do? You got to go with all. You got to go with all. Sometimes one thing might be stronger than the other. However, all of them will nevertheless still support each other. That's important. Okay? This is 99% of the time. I cannot say probably 100% of the time, but 99% of the time, if you combine all of this together, then you're going to win your interpretation, okay? So this one is really, really good when you want to argue with Scripture. If you want to know one of the secrets on how I can argue Scripture, this is it here. I always have all this in mind, actually. I just didn't think about this top one, spiritual dispensationalism. But these, all these, I always had it in mind. So even if it's a brand new verse that cultists use that you don't know how to argue against, just look at the context, look at the word exactly as it says, think about the historical timeline that it's in, and think about other scriptures that match the wording, and then you're going to win the argument, okay? So this is the best interpretation method. Now, the class that I want to teach the most is hermeneutics, actually. This is one of them, spiritual dispensationalism. So you get a big icing on the cake on this one, all right? Because this will cover probably 50% of the hermeneutic tool that you're hearing tonight, okay? Now that we understand how we know that spiritual interpretation is foolproof is comparing Scripture with Scripture combined with all this, okay? So that's 100% foolproof. What I mean by 99% earlier is 99% when you're debating with different people, okay, on whose interpretation is right. But usually how you can find the spiritual, this, when you spiritualize a verse, if you use this method, it is 100% foolproof, okay? You cannot go against it. You cannot go against it. It's 100% foolproof. The only question is, though, whose interpretation is right? See, when you win an argument, that's what I mean there. All right, I don't know if that was way over your head, but if you, have, if you didn't understand, you can ask me after class, okay? But the point is, is that this is 100% foolproof. Now, this is the fun part. Ready? Yeah. Okay, spiritually, okay? Spiritually. Before I get to the really fun part, let me explain the next interesting part, okay? Let us go to... 1 Corinthians 12, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. Now, we've explained how we can spiritually interpret the Word of God. It's through the words, right? It's through the words, comparing 
spiritual things with spiritual, and then these other things will boost it as well. And that's academically supported and theologically supported. It is academically supported by uh, historical criticism and theological hermeneutic scholars where they're trying to come up with methods to bridge the historical literal with spiritual. See that? The second thing why this is definitely foolproof is theologians believe in it because of Millard Erickson's book that usually Christians go by literal interpretation first according to its historical timeline. You try to do that. If it doesn't work after that, then you go to the metaphorical or the allegorical or the spiritual approach with other hermeneutical tools, okay? So everyone agrees with that. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, the Bible says something about the Spirit here. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 4, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one in the self same Spirit. The Spirit what? Dividing to every man severally as he will. Now, there's something very interesting here to think about. The Holy Spirit ministers to everybody differently. He divides. You see that? Yeah. This Holy Spirit divides things differently that fits appropriately to different groups of people. Now, can you think of dispensationalism after that? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's real good. Or were you lost? God, remember our last lesson in, in, in the theological approach. God, when he, cre when he had his plan, dispensations, he divided severally every man as he will. And by the way, that's what the word said right here. Verse 11, dividing to every man severally as he will. Verse 11. Right? See that? How can all that be done? Because that's through a spiritual approach. That's the Holy Spirit's job. So if that's what he's done, then that's why when you look at the Word of God, you can see all these verses divided that would fit to the appropriate person, how they would look at a verse. That's why a verse can have double application. Because on one application, it can fit to some group of people on some time period, and then another group of people to another time period. That's the Holy Spirit's job, dividing severally every man as he will. Divides spiritual things, right? So spiritual things such as the Word of God, right? So let's put Word. Spiritual things like his word, to what? He divides it to different groups of people and time periods. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. So why doubt double application in a certain verse then? Now this is going to open up a whole bunch of things when we uh, get to next week. So next week we're going to continue this teaching on the personal or devotional or practical application. That's gonna, we don't understand what that means, guys, all right? I'm telling you, we really don't understand what that means. I'm gonna show you the deeper meaning next week. It's gonna be really eye-opening, okay? This is more, uh, this is more practical. Dispensationalism is more practical than you think for your life. Amen. It's more preaching than you think for your own personal life. But we'll cover that in our next week uh, teaching, okay? Now, we know, what's that? Two weeks, yes, two weeks, in two weeks. Thank you, <laughs> you reminded me. Two weeks, two weeks. 
people online are like saying, what? You know? All right, two weeks, okay. Anyway, in two weeks. So we see that's how the Holy Spirit works. That's how he, spiritually. So when you do a, uh, let me, let me add this word, that way we can understand. Spiritually meaning spiritual application as well, okay? So don't get lost. That's what a whiteboard is for so that we can understand so far. When you do spiritual application or do things spiritually, see that? What's going on? The Holy Spirit, he divides spiritual things, which could also mean his words, to different persons and different time periods. He can do that, okay? So that's pretty eye-opening. Now, the next thing to realize about spiritual application, we can see from Scripture that basically what I'm telling you, this hermeneutical tool and method is valid. It is very valid. And it is very objective, truthful. Because Jesus said how people get truth is from the Spirit to begin with. Yeah, amen. I know we got the Word of God, but if it was just paper and words, then you're not going to get truth. Yeah, come on. But if these words have Spirit in it, and these words are spiritual, not just words, then see, that's why it has truth. So a lot of people uh, take lightly the spiritual application. That is absolutely essential for truth. Come on. If, there, if, if you deny that, then let's say that this word is not spiritual, then it's no truth. If Christ in you, your salvation is not spiritual, then it's not true. If everything has to be scientific, then you got to realize this. Then there is no God. There is no God. There is no heaven. See, there is a realm outside of our physical universe. John, let's go to John. 16. I didn't even cover the really fun part, all right? So let me give this one, then we'll cover the really, really fun part. John chapter 16. Now the Holy Spirit's job is to guide and lead us into all truth. In verse 13, John 16, 13, the Bible says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So notice right here that spiritual application is also very objective. It is truth. That's why I said valid, critical. No surprise right there. So it is truth no matter what. What does that mean? That means if you're going to use a dispensational approach, you must have a spiritual approach. If you drop the spiritual approach, then you drop truth. All right. Now I'm going to give you the interesting parts on spiritual application that works with every application out there. Okay? Now, here we go. Now, this is the really, really fun part. I am super excited, okay? And if you get bored, that's okay. I'll be the only one excited, okay? This is going to be really, really fun. Okay. All righty then. I was writing all this down inside the plane, so let's see here. Okay. We got um, in the Bible, I'm going to try to cover as much as I can. And I'm sure you can find more that I didn't cover. There are certain verses in the Bible that God uses as pictures of something. And he considers that to be truth. That's from spiritual application. There are, here is the mo most famous one, allegorical interpretation. Usually people associate that with spiritual interpretation, right? But allegorical 
functions because of the spiritual application. It needs that too. And that is considered truth. Moreover, not just the allegorical, doctrinal. If you want to argue doctrine, you need the spiritual application. Maybe not all the time, but you do need it at times. The spiritual application you're going to find out is crucial to prove your doctrinal interpretation. It is necessary also for practical devotional. Think about it, guys. I mean, uh, we are so doctrinally minded, yet why would we use Old Testament passages for our sermons if we're so doctrinal? I mean, haven't you seen our preacher boys use the book of Psalm, use the book of Exodus, and use the book of Revelation to apply something to you to preach to you a sermon? Why can we freely, like 1 Corinthians 2 says, use those verses to apply it for us, practically speaking, devotionally speaking, because of spiritual application? That's why you need that. Okay, so anyway, that's practical, devotional, okay. By the way, I'm going to give you, so I'm going to show you verses in the Bible that proves that these methods are used within the spiritual plane, okay? I'm going to prove to you that, that we can pull up any verse in the Bible and use a sermon out of it. There's nothing wrong with that. Why? Because other people did that in the Bible that I'm going to show you. And then the other one, if we have time, Hopefully we'll cover these if, if we have more time, but historical, even historical interpretation. Get this now, guys. Including the historical in interpretation, if you're going to use a, you know, the right person, the right time period, but then God's going to switch it to a different person, different time period because of that spiritual application. All right? So even historical criticism or a dispensational perspective, Mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalists, they, see, they only look at a historical approach, but uh, they ignore the spiritual approach, which is going to show you something else. All right, now, and then, if that ain't all, the last one, believe it or not, believe it or not, spiritual application is also literal application. You might go, really, how does that work? It's more literal than you think, okay? All right, let's see how much we can cover. Here we go. Before I get onto these, though, there's, you, you would want to hear this, okay? This is the most important thing. What are we doing when we um, spiritually apply verses? We're spiritualizing, right? So this is also known as spiritualizing. So let me write that down. Uh, now, basic 101, even f uh, philosophers will admit this, and Bible believers will admit this, okay? You've you got to go back to the basics. Look at the foundation. Don't just assume you know what it is and go on. All right? If you go back to the basics, then it'll help you with the deeper stuff. Do you know what spiritualize means? You have to think about that. You ready? You ready? What does spiritualize mean? You are transporting one thing to another thing. That's why it's double application. Can I repeat that again? You are transport. What does spiritualize mean? You're taking an object or a person or something. I don't care. Maybe a picture or an allegory or a doctrine or something like that. You're taking an object or a person or a time period. I could care, all right? But basically, you're taking anything that's not spiritual. See that? It's something else. And then you're transforming that into something spiritual. 
What did you do? You took this one application and changed it into another application. That means double application. Did that make any sense or were you all lost? Can you if you, give me an example? Yeah, okay. So when I when we go through this, I think that'll be easier, sir. So let's do that, okay? When we go through these examples, we will do that. Okay. So here we go, um, but maybe uh, I'll, get, I'll just give one easy example, just in case, all right? I'll give one easy example. Okay, this is a physical book, all right? This is a physical book with letters and paper and words in it, but we call it the spiritual words of God. In one application, see that? This is a physical book with ink and pages, but... What did God do with this ink, words, and pages and all that? He spiritualized it. He transformed it. He transported it into a spiritual word that has meaning and power in our spiritual lives. So see, in one dimension, it's physical, but there's another dimension to it that's spiritual. Okay? Here's... We're going to look at several examples that can just explain it. But that's what that, uh, Pastor Reese meant by dimensional approach. See, it's that spiritualizing. That's the only way you can do that. Okay, but anyway, let's uh, look at several examples here, okay? So let's look at picture. So one dimension, we see a picture. A picture is a picture, okay? That's what it is. But notice what God does. He transforms that picture into something else. Okay, let's go to, yes, I am, I am excited. Okay, let us go to, there are two passages. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10. This is the plainest one, okay? This is the easiest one. 1 Corinthians 10. All right, let's look at verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. Look at this. Notice uh, what God did, all right? Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all uh, drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock. Now, we know from that story, the story is about the Jews who ate manna, who ate quail, and they also drank water from a rock, right? So notice, from this physical plane, it's a physical rock, right? Look, uh, when Moses hit that rock and water gushed out, that ain't Jesus Christ, physically. It's a rock, okay? But God took that picture, see that? Transported it and changed it into a spiritual application and says, that's Jesus Christ. Because if you keep reading, verse 4, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was what? What? Well, obviously not physically. What is he doing? He's just taking a picture, changing it to a spiritual meaning, and pointing out that the rock is Jesus Christ. See that? Transporting one to the second plane here. Double application. Historically, yeah, Moses was literally hitting a physical rock. See that? That's one application. It's a physical, literal rock he hit. He didn't hit Jesus, okay? But God took that physical rock and spiritually transformed that, spiritually transported that into a spiritual meaning. He said that's a picture of Jesus Christ. That's what he did. See that? So it's a double application. One application is the physical rock. Second application is Jesus Christ. That's how he did it. All right, here's another, here, uh, here's another one, okay? So it said right here, isn't that interesting? Verse 3, spiritual meat, yeah. spiritual drink. Why, we know that they weren't, you know, drinking spiritual drink or eating spiritual meat. It was literal. It was real and physical. But God, see that, took that and spiritually 
saw that as a picture of spiritual meat, spiritual drink, which represented Jesus Christ. Now, if you compare scripture with scripture, you know what that is. John chapter 6, Jesus said, you partake in my meat and my drink, flesh and blood. See that? This is really amazing stuff. All right, here's another one, all right? God takes pictures seriously. Let's look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. He takes pictures seriously. This spiritual application is so important that when Moses hit that rock twice, God kicked him out of the promised land. Yeah. Why? Because he ruined God's spiritual application. Yeah. When you ruin spiritual application, I wonder how much God takes it seriously. And you don't think spiritual application is important? God could be seeing something else. That's why this is very important. Okay, let's, here's another one, all right? Here's a stronger, here's another one. It's a stronger one, Hebrews 11. How much is spiritual application important? Enough where a, a parent has to sacrifice his child, be willing to do that. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Notice right here, uh, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. He had to be willing to sacrifice his son. And that he had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him what? In a figure. In a figure, a picture. What? Abraham was thinking, God, why would you let, why would you tell me to sacrifice my only begotten son? I believe you're going to raise him from the dead if that were to happen. That's why God said, because that's a picture of my son, Jesus Christ. Only begotten son, sacrificed and resurrected. I take that seriously, that I want you to do that, an extreme act like that, because it's a picture. See that? So from one plane, it is Isaac, not Jesus Christ. But God spiritually applied it See, now it's changed, spiritually changed, into Jesus Christ. Double application again. See that? So when we read the book of Genesis, when we look at that application, it's Isaac. It's not Jesus. But spiritually, see, double application, we have to see that he's picturing Jesus Christ. All right. That's just picture. Wait till we get the other stuff, okay? Now let's go to Galatians 4. Galatians 4. Now you understand why we say double application? This is very eye-opening because we're spiritualizing. What that means is we're taking it from its given plane and changing it to another plane. We're transporting from one application to a different application. That's what spiritualize means. Otherwise, I don't know how you're going to explain that. What does spiritualize mean? You're not content with that one plane, that one application. You're changing it to a different application. That's what you're doing. Okay, so Galatians 4. Galatians 4. All right, verse 21. Tell me. So Paul is arguing, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Oh, so Paul now is arguing scripture, like this is truth statement. As much of truth statement as God took pictures seriously, right? But now he's arguing truth statement. How is he arguing against the Jews? Through pictures. <laughs> so is that a really good argument using pictures? Apparently the Bible thinks so. See? Because he says right here, verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. So notice right here that Abraham, I'm not, Paul is quoting a passage in the Bible and he's using uh, Hagar and Sarah, the pictures of Hagar and Sarah, to prove his doctrine that Hagar represents the Old Testament law, but that's not the promised seed. It's through Sarah, which is what? Isaac, by faith. 
the children. If you go to uh, verse 24, which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. See, he's comparing Mosaic Old Testament law to Hagar, that it's bondage, it's not good. And he's using a picture to prove that. Verse 25, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is bondage with her, with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above us, is free, which is the mother of us all. And who is that? That is verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So that's what he's arguing right here. He's using a picture to prove doctrinal truth. Now... You know what that picture is called at verse 24? Which things are a what? No, so then, not just picture, this is an allegory. What did he do? He used the allegory of Hagar and Sarah. See this? Check this out. Transporting them spiritually, because that's what he did with picture, right? It's following 1 Corinthians 10 and Hebrews 11. That's what, that's what it is doing. So he is using spiritual approach here, all right? There's no doubt about that because he's done that with pictures. So allegory, he's doing the same thing. He's transporting that to what? Old Testament law versus New Testament salvation faith. Hagar is not carrying Ten Commandments, obviously, when we read the book of Genesis. Sarah is not stamped on her forehead, believe Jesus died, buried, resurrected, when we read the book of Genesis. Literally, Hagar's a bondmaid. Sarah is the wife of Abraham. But God saw those things as pictures or allegory of what? Of New Testament and Old Testament salvation. He took that plain that application of Hagar and Sarah, one, to this other application, two, which is what? New Testament salvation versus Old Testament salvation right there. So see that double application. So when you read the book of Genesis, it's not just the story of Sarah and Hagar. Take another application when you read it. The other application is, see how Old Testament Law versed against New Testament faith. See that? This is very eye-opening. Now, did I make that up? No, I compared Scripture with Scripture. Even uh, with the rock that was Christ, I compared Scripture with Scripture. See that? It's pretty obvious right here. Even with Isaac, Scripture with Scripture, it says his only begotten son. Look up other verses that says only begotten son. Look up other verses that says resurrected son. Only begotten son that resurrected. Come on, come on, what do you think it is? 144,000 Jehovah Witnesses? See, this is not free for all interpretation. This is scripture with scripture, and it becomes more eye opening. It is truth. It's truth planting on truth, truth above all truths, not free for all. All right, that ain't all. Now let's go to doctrine already. This is fun, doctrinal. All right, my wife, when my wife is nodding really hard, that means I'm doing a good job. Okay, yes, yes. Okay, she, she's excited too. Yes, it's working. All right, I'm, I'm super excited now. All right, so now let's go to the book of Romans chapter, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, and then Joel 2. Let's go to Romans 10, and then we'll go to Joel 2. When you get tired on an airplane, thoughts come to your mind and ideas flow. <laughs> okay, let's go to Joel 2 and then uh, Romans chapter 10. Check this out, all right? Romans chapter 10, verse uh, 13. We know this famous verse. Now, this is doctrine, right? Is this doctrine? Yeah, this is doctrine. Your salvation's betting on it. That's a soteriological doctrine. Everybody uses this, no matter what denomination you are. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But do you know 
what verse Paul is quoting from for his doctrine? Okay. Well, uh, before I write that, let's go to Joel 2, okay? Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. This is the verse that he's quoting. Verse 32, Joel 2, verse 32. And it shall come to pass, so whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Not saved, but delivered. Now, delivered and saved can be the same thing. But this is not New Testament salvation. Keep reading. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. What's that? That's the second advent in the future when God rescues the nation of Israel as they are surrounded by the Antichrist United Nations. And you can see that developing right now. I mean, the evidence is also when you look at verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. See, it's talking about the coming of the Lord. Second Advent, when Jesus comes and conquers his enemies, the Antichrist United Nations rescues his nation of Israel. That's the doctrine. But Paul took that doctrine and applied it to a different doctrine. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can you see that right there? Notice what Paul did. So what did Paul do? Paul took the doctrine of Second Advent. The only way, think about this, the only way and the only authority he had to change this doctrine to another side of the doctrine is because the Holy Spirit inspired him. The Holy Spirit led him to write it. What's that? A spiritual Transaction again. A spiritual working again. See what happened right here? So it was spiritualized again, but when it's spiritualized, it's giving another doctrine. New Testament salvation. Double application. See that? Notice that right there, how the Holy Spirit did that. Ain't that something? Double doctrine there. Double doctrine. So when you read that verse, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered or shall be saved, you know what you see? Not one doctrine. You see two. So when you quote, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved or delivered, however way you want to use the last wording, when you quote that for New Testament salvation, think about the other doctrine too. It's a nation of Israel being restored. Can you imagine that? When you're street preaching to these people, you're prophesying at the same time that the nation of Israel will be restored. You already told them what side you're on in this conflict, this crazy conflict that's going on. So when you're quoting that, do you, can you see the God, the Holy Spirit, God up in heaven when he hears that all the time? What he's thinking? See, double doctrine. And that's just one. You can find plenty of verses from Paul on that one. Yeah. There's a lot of verses. Another verse is Romans 15. Romans 15. We'll look at this other verse. But there are plenty of other verses. Romans chapter 15. Now notice that Paul, he's quoting scripture again concerning the Gentiles. In Romans chapter 15 and then verse, uh, let's see right here. No, 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 no. No, not 10. 12, 12. Romans, uh, Romans 15, 12. And again, Isaiah saith. Oh, so Paul is directly quoting from Isaiah. There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. Notice right here that Paul is quoting this verse again for Gentiles believing in the gospel. Okay? That's what Paul used it for. That's a problem because what he's quoting from is go to the book of Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. That's not what it is. 
Go to Isaiah 11. Paul argues this verse is doctrinally for Christian salvation. But Isaiah will point out, no, doctrinally, this is the restoration of Israel, second advent again. So when you look at general epistles again, and then you see that verse doctrinally for uh, church age, but then again, the verse doctrinally for tribulation Jew, is that valid? Yeah, because spiritually, the spiritual application showed that already twice. Now we're going to see the twice, the second time here, all right? Let's look at Romans, uh, Isaiah chapter 11. Notice what he's quoting right here. Verse 10, verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign, ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles seek. All right, that's it. But notice right here, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left. Look at that. That second advent there. Sometime in the future when God restores the nation of Israel. We see that again. So when Paul is quoting Romans 15, Paul says that's doctrinally New Testament salvation. But Isaiah says, no, doctrinally that's second advent. Well, they're both right. What happened here? Paul, because he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, he was able to spiritualize it. See that? So he took the second, the doctrine, see that doctrine of the second Advent verse, and through spiritualization, he was able to doctrinally make that New Testament salvation. Otherwise, how can Paul, I would like to ask you this. What other justification did Paul have besides the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Without the spiritual recommendation, spiritual approval of the apostles, where Jesus Christ said, I would give you my Holy Spirit. What other basis? He's fabricating and lying then, all right? That's the only basis why we believe Paul. Okay. Think about that. See, this spiritualization, this spiritual application is, is what? Truth, valid, critical. It's important. Without it, you have no authority to interpret and I don't care how you interpret this freely 10 different ways. You're no different from a literal, uh, liberal with, uh, with re uh, receptive literary uh, interpretation. The only basis you can freely interpret the verse is spiritual. Only, only based on the spirit. That speaks strongly of volumes there. That's why this method is indisputable. I see that. It's too strong. There's no way around it. All right. Now you're ready to see the practical devotional. Check this, okay? Go to Acts 2 and Joel 2. Go to Joel 2. And Acts 2. Now, notice right here what Peter did, okay? Acts chapter 2. Notice that when Peter is preaching to the Jews there, verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Now when he's preaching right here, you know what's going on with him? He is filled with the Holy Spirit when he's preaching because of uh, verse uh, chapter 2 and verse 4. Chapter 2 and verse 4. The Holy Spirit filled all those apostles to preach. So Peter is filled with that Holy Ghost and he's preaching to them. While being filled with the Holy Ghost, see that? Check this out. Verse 16, filled with the Holy Spirit, he quotes a passage from Joel. 
about all those people who spoke in tongues at the book of Acts. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord. And it shall come to uh, day of the Lord come and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, is that passage familiar? That's Joel 2. All right. You know what Peter basically said? He said when he's quoting Joel, what you're seeing right now when these people are speaking in tongues, it matches with what Joel said about pretty soon uh, in your days, the children of Israel, that your generations, your children, your children's children are going to prophesy in my name. But when he's saying that, he said, the sun's going to turn into darkness, the moon into blood. And then he also said that this is before the great and notable day of the Lord. That did not happen. <laughs> What's he talking about? Is he stupid? Or is, it, or is the Holy Spirit really filling him, as the Bible says? Joel 2. That don't match. Joel chapter 2. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your son and your daughter shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great uh, and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said and the remnant whom the Lord shall call. False prophet Peter, Jerusalem, lost its, lost its nation. They weren't delivered. Unless, unless he's finding things in that verse that can practically apply to them. Just like every single one of you preachers who pray for the filling of the Spirit and you take some random verse in the Bible that has no doctrinal application to you, but you preach it as if it can apply to them and convict them. Because you're looking at it from a practical standpoint how that verse can fit for that person. Why? Because that's the Holy Spirit's job, is to fit it to every person as he will. How about that? Bible believers have a hard time explaining this passage and a lot of them will say that well what he's doing is that he's just simply quoting the passage and then trying to find things in there that can uh that that fit with what they're doing something that works like a preaching like a sermon well what is that if that's not spiritual application that's the only way you can get around that otherwise peter's lying otherwise peter's a false prophet the only way he could do that, the only basis and the only authority, he was filled with the Spirit when he said that. What's that? Again, you cannot separate that spiritual power, that spiritual operation, that spiritual application. There's no way you can do that. What Peter did was, see, he took Joel, two, uh, Joel chapter 2, and there was a spiritualization process going on when he preached that as a practical devotional application. Let's be honest, when you read the book of Psalm, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I know you can think about historically David, prophetically Jesus, but practically to you, you feel like that, right? And that's the Holy Spirit working on your heart. See that? You can't escape that spiritualizing process. Here's another one, all right? Let's go to uh, historical. Ready for this? So what happened here? Practical devotional. What did Peter do? Peter took the passage of uh, the tribulation, blood, fire, pillar of smoke. Come on, man. <laughs> that never happened in his time. But he took that and then applied it 
to Acts chapter 2, their time period. Acts speaking of tongues. What was that? Double application. I know one application, it's the tribulation, Joel chapter 2. But Peter saw that as, this will make good preaching for what we're doing right now. That's how he saw it as the application. And he had the spiritual authority, the spiritual basis for that. Historical. This is fun. All right. Go to Revelation. Revelation 11. Revelation 11. Get ready for this. Okay, and historical. When you look at the passage, and this is where mid-acts hyper-dispensationalists get it wrong. Historical criticism scholars get it wrong. Sometimes the atheist scholars get it wrong because they're only looking at a historical approach. But when you're looking at a location or a person or something at a historical time plane, God could be spiritually seeing that as something else. He might spiritualize it and give it a different name too. You want proof? Revelation 11. Look at this. Verse 8. This is what's going to happen in the tribulation. This is real life. This will happen in our history. Revelation 11, 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which what? Spiritual. Say that again. Spiritual. Is called Sodom and Egypt. Not historically. What is it historically? Where also our Lord was crucified. That's Jerusalem. Oh, told you so. Notice historically, it's to Jerusalem, but God spiritually sees it as Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at that switching people, groups of people right there. He even called them Sodom and Gomorrah spiritually. Ain't that something? So when you're reading general epistles, I could care less if it's historically first century Christians, first century churches, or historically to Jews in the tribulation. God could be spiritually seeing that as a different group of people, different time period then. You want greater evidence? Revelation 1. Now let's see how this works. This makes sense. Revelation 1. Verse 11, Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. The Bible says, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So notice that John is historically writing to seven churches. First century Christian churches. He's writing out letters to them. Oh, but we got a problem right here because uh, when you read verse 19, it says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Uh, then we got another problem right here. Another problem is when we go backwards, the Bible says in verse uh, 4, uh, verse 3 is better, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him, which is in which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Yeah. Okay, then we got a problem here. John says he's writing about tribulation. Okay, so that's why mid-Acts, they'll insist, no, these are not historically seven churches in the first century. These are seven churches sometime in the tribulation. Well, the, you know what the answer is? <laughs> Just like he did at Revelation 11? Simple. Well, why is it such a hard thing? Historically, he's writing to seven churches that are there at that time. But God spiritually sees also that what? It's to those churches in the future tribulation. And you wonder why Revelation 2 and 3 is church age doctrine and tribulation doctrine. 
How about that? Ain't that something? Ain't that something? I mean, there's no way around it. I don't know how else you're going to go around it. I mean, God is writing tribulation doctrine. He said that. At the same time, he's writing historically to seven churches. What's the easy answer? The easy answer is why not work both ways? <laughs> That's what the academic scholars always struggled with, see? They always struggle with the spiritual interpretation and then the historical interpretation. Well, both are valid. It's that simple. Why is God able to do that? Because he can take something historically and spiritualize it to something else. What's that? From one application to another application. Double application. This is crazy. What do you mean by that? Next time, all right? So, all right, you got to come next time, all right? All right. Literally more literal than you think, all right? Yeah. It's actually more simple than you think, too, all right? So you'd be surprised. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. I hope you enjoy tonight's teaching. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching has incredibly opened our eyes and made us read, study, interpret the verse more fervently in a dispensational Bible-believing approach, believing strongly in a double application approach throughout your scriptures, Lord, rather than a one-minded application that is not dispensational or that is hyper-dispensational. I pray that we will not fall into that trap. Lord, what an amazing book that you've got because it is spirit. Your words are spirit and they are life. That's why it's so incredible. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.